support. But um, as far as people thinking, oh, this was just such an injustice for these teachers, I think that there were a lot of people that felt that way, but it was just so quiet, you know, like we just thought that the courtrooms were gonna be packed, you know, maybe on certain days, but it was really, I think people didn't know how to feel because here you have, you're trotting out a lot of these black children um, and saying, look what happened to them and it's their fault, it's their teacher's fault, that's why they're not successful. You know, and we're just thinking like, and I'll um, just to tell a quick story about what happened during the trial. Um, during the closing arguments, one of the prosecutors actually posed some questions to the jury and he was he was like why is crime so high why are you scared somebody gonna hit you on the back of your head and take your car you know who's breaking into your house and we're sitting here like is he blaming us for this you know like is he for real he was for real <laughs> you know he was blaming us and so you know I'm not really sure where he's from but just the, going back to the history of Atlanta in our book we talk about the um this was like a white prosecutor, right? This was a and black I, man. Right. Oh. And let's go ahead. Oh, yeah. I think I'll leave it. And a black mayor and a black district attorney and black yes. prosecutors. So that's part of the, that that's racial part dynamic. That's why the people felt like, yes. oh, well, this wasn't a race thing. It was the mayor was yeah. black and the district we attorney was black. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and it's like, yes, I understand that. Yeah. Um, but there were some white educators that that's were it. implicated in the investigative report and none of them were indicted. So this is the Lochner plan and um, just going back to how we were blamed for all of these problems of, of the children, if you go back to the, um, the 1940s and 50s, the, the same schools that were implicated in the, um, the scandal where teachers and administrators were pulled from to go onto those indictments, if you look at their, the neighborhoods, the history of the neighborhoods, these were thriving black communities. There were several black owned businesses. It was safe. Um, but then they created the Lochner Plan in the, in the 1940s and yeah. 50s, which was a plan for highway construction to rip right through the middle of these communities. Thousands of people were displaced. Um, homes were taken through eminent domain. Um, and so this was the beginning of the destruction of these neighborhoods. And then you, you have um, the drug wars. There was a veteran teacher that worked at my school who had taught at um, the school that I worked at, Paul Lawrence Dunbar Elementary, in, since the 70s. And she said that before the crack epidemic, it was totally different. She said there was so much parental involvement. She said they had to put the parents on a waiting list for certain things because they just wanted to be involved with their um, children's education. The, the children came to school you know, ready and prepared to learn. Um, but she said after the crack epidemic, everything changed, you know. Um, and so you have a lot of the parents are going to prison now. You know, you have mass incarceration. You have so many different factors that have led to the destruction of these communities, even to the destruction of education. You have, um, I believe it was $9 billion that was taken out of public education. Mm -hmm. um, so there are so many different factors as to why some of these children and their families, you know, perhaps might not have been as you know, <coughs> successful. Um, so to blame it on the, their teachers, that was the part that was most disheartening, mm -hmm. you know. Um, teaching is a tough job, and, and it's not that every teacher is just, you know, um, it's, it's not that every teacher is just, just the best job, but I would say the vast majority of teachers truly do care about children. Mm -hmm. They sincerely go into it for the right reasons. Um, and so it was just really disheartening to have someone to, to like blame it on us. And it wasn't just him. It was like the, this overall sentiment in the air, you know, like this is the reason why these children have failed. And so it's, it just goes back to that scapegoating. Um, if you can scapegoat people, you don't actually ever have to fix the system. You don't have to fix a problem. You can just keep throwing people under the bus and say, well, it was them. You know, it was their fault. And so, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, we go through these periods of time to show that um, the people who actually were responsible for harming black communities through these decades um, were some of the same folks that orchestrated parts of the cheating scandal and stood to benefit in certain ways from the cheating scandal. So the, um, I'll, play with. <laughs> oh yeah, well just even going from 
Yeah, so this is Mike Bowers. This is one of the lead investigators. He was the Attorney General of Georgia in the 1980s and 90s, and he was one of the main people pushing the tough on crime laws, the drug wars, all these things that are leading to generational trauma um, that are affecting students. Um, let's play this. Ah, kill, kill. This may or may not play correctly. But this is him running for governor in 1996, um, warning his constituents um, about... That's all right, we can let it go. I'll tell y'all what he said. <laughs> he said that black children are super predators and that we need to watch out because there's a lot more five-year-olds today. So he's drumming up his white voter base with uh, by villainizing black children. And then he's one of the most vocal people, years later, talking about those same children, going on the news and saying, these poor children were cheated by these teachers. Um, so going from calling them super predators to these poor cheated children. Um, but going back to the Lochner plan that was a, a systematic dismantling of black neighborhoods, that was a plan that was pushed by an organization called Central Atlanta Progress that is functioned really as a shadow government of Atlanta. It's um, a community of um, business leaders that would um, craft policy and that policy would get enacted by our elected officials. Um, and one of their members in particular sort of is a good through line for understanding how these different pieces connect. His name is Tom Cousins and he's a developer. And um, he was very active in Central Atlanta Progress um, during the years of urban renewal um, when black communities were being taken over through eminent domain and, and um, dismantled. Um, throughout the 80s when uh, Central Atlanta Progress was advocating for the city to subsidize um, luxury housing when there was an affordable housing crisis in the city. And then in the 90s, he gets involved in the sort of, uh, not, even, not reinvestment, gentrification. So there's been this intentional disinvestment, and then the flip side of that now is gentrification, right? And so in the 90s, his role in that is tied directly to the schools, because he comes up with a plan to take um, one of Atlanta's public housing complexes called East Lake Meadows, turn it into mixed income housing, displace hundreds of black families that are um, on subsidized rent, and to, there's a um, public school down the street, Drew, Char Drew Elementary, um, and he's gonna take that over and turn it into the city's first charter school. And he explained that reasoning by saying, this school is going to ensure that the market rate units of this redeveloped mixed income uh, apartments, that those market rate units are in demand. So he's saying that this charter school is what's going to draw in the white residents that they want to populate, populate what was formerly a public housing project. Now he continues to have influence over city government through um, Mayor Shirley Franklin's tenure when um, the city comes up with a plan for the Beltline, which is our like massive uh, sort of glorified bike trail project that's been going on for years and is one of the biggest driving forces of gentrification in terms of just jacking up the property taxes everywhere that that thing touches. Um, and his son-in-law becomes the head of the city's investment agency or investment um, department called Invest Atlanta, and they start cutting these deals called tax allocation district deals, and that's, y'all have that here, a lot of places do, it's called tax increment financing here, and it's a way to take property taxes and put it in a slush fund for private development. So the property taxes are supposed to go to the city, the county, and the school system. So this is education money getting used to build the Beltline, to build luxury condos, to build literally a Hard Rock Hotel was in the works until this thing was challenged by um, a, a lawsuit um, and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution published an article quoting one of the lawyers that was um, you know, making his riches off of orchestrating this Hard Rock Hotel and he was like, I'm so disappointed we aren't going to get this school money for the Hard Rock Hotel. Like, people are saying these things um, as if that's an appropriate use of this money. So we sort of go through all that to say, who has really been cheating these children? <laughs> if this is what's been happening in Atlanta up to the point of this cheating scandal, um, and then Drew Charter School gets portrayed during the cheating scandal in another article in the AJC um, as the shining like beacon of hope compared to what's going on in the courtroom. So this reporter visits Drew Charter School and he visits, comes and sits in on one of the trial days um, and says everything that's wrong with public schools is evident in this courtroom and everything that's right in education is evident in this charter school. And so the profiteering that's happening by tying charter schools to real estate development is getting bolstered by creating this narrative that the cheating scandal is the worst thing to ever happen to education. So 
that's how I would connect those dots. That was a long. <laughs> a long how do you really feel about it? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. it makes me so mad. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I, I've heard a lot of this earlier today. I'm still kind of dumbfounded by by it, and and this is what I actually researched. So um, you know, and, and I'm seeing a lot of the connections to. Um, to Philadelphia and our own kind of story around education and yeah. how it becomes a kind of like real estate land grab, um, mm -hmm. you know, particularly for a number of our schools, it's been you know s selling off um, the old the kind the old school buildings that mm -hmm. are then repurposed for um, you know pop up like hipster bars and mm -hmm. um, and housing and um, you know there. It's one of the few ways that the school district can actually make money um, is to s sell off their real estate. So, um, and they're one of the largest landowners um, <coughs> within, the, within the city's um, boundaries. Um, I, yeah, there are two other strands that I that I kind of wanted to follow here a little bit, but then also wanted to open it up to um, a little bit. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm like, well, actually, let, let's let's talk. Can we talk about the trial? Um, and like, so, Shawnee, where, what was? Could you talk a little bit about what the trial was like, um, and and where where you what your situ you and everyone else who um, was indicted, um, mm -hmm. what the situation is right now? Um, so they were up with things that just assist you know you know that I guess they feel almost it's like they're taken for granted mm -hmm. or. Um, because it's almost in a sense of we know what's best for our children, you know, and so to have someone to just kind of come in and just, oh, we don't need you anymore in a sense. We're going to just replace you with, with these teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm all for diversity and things like that. Yeah. But it's really blatant that they're getting, they're trying to shuffle out, you know, the black teachers. Really, it's blatant. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then with our trial. There were a lot of folks that um, that I heard about that didn't even want to go into teaching anymore. Black teachers, yeah. black you know people mm -hmm. who wanted to be teachers after seeing us handcuffed and mm -hmm. my co-defendants handcuffed, they had second thoughts of even going into the profession, which is really sad because we need good, strong black teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so even that, you know, was a way. To, it was almost like, look what we can do to you, you know. Yeah. Like yeah. you could you could be criminalized for becoming a teacher. Yeah. You know, like who would want to go through that? Yeah, and I think um, this with these charges in particular, that given the history of business interests in Atlanta uh, relying on schools to market the, their real estate ventures and saying, you know, we we're trying to raise property values so that we can get rich off of these developments, and we need the schools to look good to attract these white folks from the suburbs to move back here. Mm -hmm. Um, that once the cheating scandal got to where it was like clear that cheating had happened, they were like, okay, we need to clean the slate somehow and s do something very drastic <laughs> to say that this is not the same school district that uh, was responsible for this cheating scandal. And we need to do something so drastic that like RICO charges applied to white teachers wouldn't have happened. Like it wouldn't have flown. <laughs> And so that's why they were like, "We'll take the black teacher, like, we'll and we'll crack down. We'll show we applied the heaviest charges we could, and then we'll say this is a clean slate, and that you know we can still champion our school system and continue our um, real estate deals that are based on uh, on those schools yeah. test scores." Do we have time for just one more question? Or well, I, I know this one thing that particularly as we move forward, just like uh, some a number of us here have been like part of the sort of like Black Lives Matter at school campaign nationally. And I think, I don't like, I feel like it's important, particularly with our Black Teachers Matter campaign, to really like leverage this story and the work, the ongoing sort of like work as an intervention that can happen, particularly because the NEA is like, well, we care about black teachers, okay. Here we go, you know what I'm saying? Here's a real opportunity that we can actually like put our uh, feet where our mouths are. Um, so I'm I'm really excited. I'm thinking about like writing an email tonight about like what that Please. could look like for yeah. our organization. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder yeah. is there a petition already out there that we could use and leverage voices behind, or what it, like in terms of like that vehicle, like what should we use to be able to? Do so that? that's been the thing. Um, I've actually spoken with my attorneys. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like we need a petition. You know. 
So we're going to have to figure out the best avenue to take. My attorneys mm -hmm. are very cautious, cautious. Yes. on right. anything that we do, right. um, which I'm happy about. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's kind of put us into this situation where we're like, what can we tell people to do? You right. know, mm -hmm. um, So that's why it's just important to stay updated and regularly check the website. And you know, I think one of the things that I really gathered from the book and our conversations today is is how important the control of the narrative is, yes. right? Because, um, yeah, I mean, if, if someone doesn't read the book, you know, there's a, it's been such a long trial, yeah. and the process has been so long, there's a lot of kind of an amnesia mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. about this, this yeah. judge, right. the entire process, what's the suit, the yeah. situation yeah. for each of you as individual teachers, and, and, and um, or as people, and what's happening, and... Um, yeah, I mean, how can we have a kind of organized, both media, um, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, narrative mm -hmm. campaign that, um, you know, would allow people to, like, keep it in the, in, in the, in the kind of public consciousness right. mm -hmm. and, and, um, and mobilize people around, you know, particularly the judge, like how, right, people need to know about this, you know, and, and frame it in a way that, um, makes it clear, right, yeah, that he right. does need to recuse himself and, you know, so that other things can actually take place and, yes. and what, what, when what hope is a, a more fair kind of equitable kind of situation, mm -hmm. you know, I'll put that in, you know, <laughs> quote, but something. So, yeah, we can get on that. Yeah, we can definitely talk about that. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like we're, we're, we're about to uh, flow into the um, organizing meeting. Right. Um, yeah. That'll be happening outside. Up, so, um, you know, see Chris. Um, but yeah, maybe on that note, um, I just want to thank our, our guests. I'm finding so, so many different mentalities today. It seems hard. It seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. So, 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 I'm ready for, I'm this, ready challenge. for this challenge, and I was built, and I was for, built this. for this. I think that, I think we, that all have we all have a purpose in life, life. and mine is and to take, take on a task that, that most of that most of back away, back away from, from. that impossible, impossible. So people say it's impossible, I see possible.